right. Hello, everyone. Uh, I do want to apologize for our technical difficulty this morning, but we are on track to start now. Um, so hello and welcome to the third webinar in the Midwest Invasive Plant Network's short series about restoring invaded sites. My name is Claire Ryan. I, I appear as Mark Renz in the, in the chat window because uh, we're borrowing his Adobe Connect account. Uh, but I'm Claire and I'm coordinator of uh, the Midwest Invasive Plant Network, or MIPIN, as we pronounce our acronym. And I'll be your moderator for today. Um, so what you should be seeing on the screen at the moment is a welcome slide just with some brief tips for Adobe Connect Audio and other functions. Uh, hopefully you've had a chance to look at it. Um, but just the, the real brief uh, important points are you want to chat, uh, type any questions you have in the chat box. And um, you can also, if you need us to speak up or speak down uh, faster or slower, you can indicate that using some of the tools there. Um, and if you have audio problems, you can call the technical support number. Um, again, sorry for our technical issues so far, uh, but we are recording the webinar. So um, folks that were not able to uh, connect successfully will be able to hear it later. Um, so just a, a really brief introduction to MIPIN. Uh, we're a regional organization representing diverse stakeholders across the Midwest. Uh, the stake, this group, groups of stakeholders make up both our membership and our board of directors, and they include researchers and educators, uh, folks from state agencies, representatives of the horticulture, nursery, and landscaping industry, and land managers also. Our mission is to reduce the impacts of invasive plants throughout the Midwest, uh, the eight, eight state region you see there on your map. Uh, the purple dots are the locations of uh, our current board of directors. And the red star is uh, over the Chicago area where we're headquartered at the Morton Arboretum. Uh, we aim to accomplish our mission by synthesizing and sharing information and by developing resources and publications. For example, MIPIN has developed a database of invasive plant-specific control methods, a regional invasive plant list uh, compiled from the individual state lists, and resources for gardeners and landscapers also. Uh, all that and more is available on our website. Uh, the URL you can see right there. Uh, we're also on Facebook and Twitter, and that's a good way to learn about what's new with us. Uh, we are a member organization and are supported by our network of contributing members. Uh, now is a great time to become a member because uh, our 2018 membership drive is just about wrapping up. Uh, there are some great benefits of membership, including uh, conference discounts, uh, discounts on bulk orders of our publications. And you can learn more about that uh, at our website, uh, just mippin.org forward slash join. And finally, we have a listserv uh, that's free and available regardless of if you're a member or not. Uh, you can join just by sending an email with your basic contact information to the address on the screen. Or you can email me as well and I can add you. I'd like to take a moment just to acknowledge and thank our partners. Uh, the U.S. Forest Service Northeastern Region is our primary funding partner for the webinar series, so thank you very much to them. I'd like to thank uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison, particularly Dr. Mark Renz's lab in agronomy for allowing us to use their Adobe Connect service. And finally, uh, of course, I want to acknowledge our partner, the Morton, Morton Arboretum, which provides MIPIN's office space and associated amenities. Of course, our speaker today is also from the Arboretum. I think I mentioned uh, at my very first slide that this, uh, this webinar is part of a series. And I just wanted to uh, give you the date for the last, actually the last webinar in our series will be uh, featuring our control database. So kind of how to use that database, how to enhance it if you'd like to, um, and how to find the solutions to whatever invasive plant problems you happen to be tangling with. Uh, so we'll have an overview of that tool and some research, uh, recent updates to it that will be on March 20th. Um, registration will be opening soon for that, and I will. Uh, it'll be on our listserv on our website as well. I did also want to let you know that videos of our past webinars are now available on YouTube. It took us a little while, but uh, 
I think now that we have our, our YouTube channel going, um, this one will be up pretty quickly. You can follow that link there. It's a little bit long. Um, you can also access it through our homepage, though, uh, under the, our, the What's New section. There's a link to, to the webinar information. So without further ado, let me uh, introduce our speaker for today. It's Kurt Dreisilker, who is actually in the room with me here at the Morton Arboretum. So uh, we won't have technical difficulties there, thank goodness. Uh, Kurt is the head of natural resources at the Arboretum. Since 2004, he's been planning and implementing ecological restoration throughout the Arboretum's 900 acres of natural areas. Um, the Arboretum status as a public garden and world-class tree museum gives Kurt a unique perspective on the management of invasive plant species. He has both a bachelor's and a master's from the University of Illinois at Urbana-Champaign, where he studied plant biology and natural resources management. Uh, Kurt has also served on Mippin's board of directors since 2012 and currently serves as our treasurer. So uh, you'll see probably a blank screen for just a second while I load Kurt's presentation, and then he will take it away. All right, here's Kurt. Okay, thank you, Claire. She handled the uh, technical difficulties with grace and dignity and did a fantastic job. My ability to do that would not have uh, ended up so well. I can get out of being stuck in the mud in the field pretty well, but not something like this in the webinar scenario. All right, well, thank you, thank you for the introduction, Claire. Uh, I trust everybody can hear me okay. Is that, is that correct? I'm going to just uh, assume that's the case. Looks like some people are typing. Um, so I'm going to talk about restoration of an oak woodland in northeastern Illinois, that being here at the Morton Arboretum, where I work. And as mentioned, there is uh, an image of me. I didn't realize Claire was going to show that already, but it's always nice to know who's talking to you on these sorts of things. So as Claire mentioned, I do manage the natural areas here at the Morton Arboretum. We have about 900 acres of natural areas, including restored prairie and oak woodlands and wetlands. And my job is to lead and develop these re ecological restoration projects. So um, I use a lot of the same tools that many of you are probably familiar with. Uh, prescribed fire, we use chainsaws and herbicide for cut down invasive species, and uh, we break drain tiles and restore wetlands and all these other fun stories that I could go on and on about. Um, but today I'm going to just zero in on just an aspect of uh, restoring our woodlands out on the east side of the property here. So first, just a little bit about the Morton Arboretum. If you haven't been to the Morton Arboretum or if you're not familiar with it, Here's our mission statement, uh, to collect and study trees, shrubs, and other plants from around the world, to display them across naturally beautiful landscapes for people to study and enjoy, and to learn how to grow them in ways that enhance our environment. Our goal is to encourage the planting and conservation of trees and other plants for a healthier, a greener, healthier, and more beautiful world. And uh, it looks like I'm missing one photo here, but you should see four images of the Arboretum at different seasons. I apologize for the uh, missing photo. I'm, I'm not sure what happened here, something with uh, maybe incorporating it into the software. But anyways, I'll keep moving along. Um, so these uh, photos just represent different scenes within the Arboretum. If you come and visit us in person, you'll get to see these in, uh, with your own two eyes in person here. Um, Joy Morton, the founder of Morton Salt, started the Morton Arboretum in 1922, and there's a picture of him. He was the uh, founder of the Morton Arboretum, but he was also the son of Julius Sterling Morton, the founder of Arbor Day. And so the founder of Arbor Day and his family loved trees, and so here is now the Morton Arboretum. And so what do we do? Well, we're basically a living museum of trees. We have trees all over the place on the property. We have natural stands in our forest on the east side, which I'll talk about, but we also have tree collections. And these are collections of trees from uh, different parts of the world. 
We have over 222,000 living plants within these collections. And since we are a museum, we do accession these plants. So we have 9,200 accessions. And those are just labels that give us lots of information that are packed with information uh, to tell us more information about those particular plants that are out on our grounds. And these, these plants come from all over the temperate world, in this case, uh, from about 42 different countries. And we have many different uh, threatened plants on some level planted into these collections. So not only is the um, conservation work important within the natural areas of the Arboretum, but also on a global scale, taking these plants from their threatened environments in their home ranges and, and planting them back here um, as a means of ex situ conservation. Uh, just a reminder, here in uh, northeast Illinois is where we're located. You can see on the red dot there. And just zooming in here, we have uh, DuPage County highlighted there in red. And then you can see my arrow showing where the Morton Arboretum is and a little bit closer still. And you can start to see the outline of the Morton Arboretum total. It's 1,700 acres. And I think I have one more slide here showing a close-up view, which we'll probably be more acquainted with as we go throughout the presentation, because I'll be referencing an image like this as we move along. Um, 1,700 acres. And we have these yellow areas, which are all of the collections. So the collections are sort of housed within the interior portion, the central portion of the Arboretum. And then outside of that are really the natural areas within the uh, property itself. And if I can get this pointer to work here, I'm going to try to get this. Uh, hmm. Uh-oh, something's happening on my end. I'm doing something I'm not supposed to. I'm going to turn it over to Claire for one second. This pointer, uh, well, anyways, the, uh, the uh, yellow areas are the collections. And outside of those yellow areas, but still within the bounds of the, of the yellow lines, those are all of the natural areas that I manage. And you can see the uh, forested stand there that um, the, the green arrow is moving around. And those are the east woods. And then we have some portions on the west side here, like in the Schulenberg Prairie, which I'll show you an image of as well. OK, I'll try not to use that pointer too often. <laughs> OK, except I do need to move that out of the way. OK. So ecological restoration at the Morton Arboretum really began in the 1960s with this gentleman right here. His name is Ray Schulenberg. And he was the first person to start planting uh, prairie plants out on the western side of the Arboretum. And uh, Ray Schulenberg grew into the Arboretum through different, uh, through different positions. He worked in propagation and so on. He knew how to grow a lot of native plants, and he was passionate about them as well. And so he was uh, then tasked with actually starting this thing that we now know of as the Schulenberg Prairie. The Schulenberg Prairie was begun in 1962. And you can see a couple of, of images here. Uh, the image on the left with Ray and a helper planting young plants into the um, open soil. Uh, so this would have been in the fall, in the summer of 1963. And then in the image on the right, you can see some of the plants that have uh, been growing um, as, as uh, part of the first attempt to restore prairie out on this uh, portion of the Arboretum. In, this, in these images here, this restoration work, as we now call it, really began on one acre of property. And now the Schulenberg Prairie, as we manage it today, is about 100 acres of tall grass prairie and savanna. So it's really come quite a long way over time. As you can see in this image here with the purple cone flowers uh, all in bloom, and the image off into the distance, you can see the prairie as it, as it continues away from the photographer and then into the adjacent savannas. So it's really uh, you know, developed quite nicely over the 50 plus years of its existence. Um, and so this is part of the natural area community that I, that I manage as well. Um, if you haven't been out to the Schulenberg Prairie, I invite you out. Here's an image of the uh, prairie in the fall, in the late summer, I should say. And you can even see a couple people, um, barely, through the tall grasses here, uh, kind of on the left center 
part of the image here. Um, the Schulenberg Prairie was um, is is actually one of the um, well, I might be biased, but I'll say that one of the uh, best uh, tall grass prairie restorations uh, around. It's one of the oldest as well, dating back again to 1962, and it's just a great place to work. So we've learned a lot of uh, a lot of things about the prairie, but that's actually not what I'm here to talk about today. I'm going to talk about the other um, side of the arboretum. I'm going to um, talk about the East Woods. And so the East Woods, as I pointed to earlier, are on the eastern side of the Arboretum. Um, it's essentially a deciduous hardwood forest dominated by white, burr, and red oak, Quercus alba, Macrocarpa, and Rubra. Um, the soils are generally deep and moderately to poorly drained forest soils, alpha sols, formed from a thin layer of luss underlied by glacial till. And the glacial till can actually um, depending on where you are, you can find 30 to 40, all the way up to 150 feet of glacial till down to bedrock. Um, so it's a, it's, an, it's a landscape impacted by the glaciers from 10 to 12,000 years ago, no doubt. Um, and I'll get into a little bit more about why it looks like uh, what it does, um, but it is ranked as a high quality natural community by the Illinois Natural Areas Inventory. So it's a pretty special place and we're going to dig right into, uh, here we go, you can see the red circle or the red oval kind of uh, outlining the general area of the East Woods as we know it today. I'm going to start off going back in time a little bit uh, looking at the DuPage County vegetation at the time when the European settlers came into this region in the early in the 1830s and 1840s. So you can see the county overall is largely composed of prairie vegetation by this kind of pinkish color. You can see prairie occupied most of the vegetation but you do definitely see some streams and then the associated timber groves alongside of those streams. Um, in the kind of center part of the county you can see the current outline of the Morton Arboretum and on the eastern end of those uh, of that property, you can see a timber grove even within the arboretum, and, and indeed that is what we are focusing our attention on today. Um, as it turns out, the public land surveyors walked right through the timber grove that we know of as the East Woods, so we have some pretty unusual data. So we're pretty fortunate to have some data showing um, what existed or what they documented at that time. Um, and that consists of white oak, red oak, and bur oak, like I mentioned before, but also hazelnut, ironwood, and basswood were also found. And I want to point out that uh, no sugar maple was documented in, in, at this time as well, and that will become more important as we go along. Here we have an aerial photograph. This is actually the oldest aerial photograph of the East Woods taken in 1939. These are images taken by the state and available online. So what I've done here is I've overlined, I've overlined the, uh, the timber grove from the public land surveyors. So you can see this thin outline uh, of a line outlining the timber grove from that time. So about almost 100 years later, um, you can see what is left of the East Woods um, in 1939 with the photograph and the uh, kind of the cookie cutter shapes within uh, the East Woods. I'm going to kind of go back and forth a couple of times so you can see this new image that I'm popping up here. The East Woods were really impacted pretty heavily by the early uh, landowners of this time. And this, this series of lines, this, these polygons that I'm pointing out here, are actually outlines of a, one property owner who had multiple properties. So you can see some of them are a little bit um, kind of uh, off-center off a little bit, but you can see how well they match up with the timber grove of the East Woods. And so these people, when they moved into the region, they really did a, a pretty significant job um, cutting the timber. And in this particular case, this landowner was documented to have cut, uh, you know, many dozens of cords of wood in the late 1800s. And you can see, um, you know, the direct result of that even many years later in 1939. So by the, by the time the Morton Arboretum was started, um, 
those open areas became the tree collections of the Arboretum, and the uh, East Woods, the timbered areas within this image, are, are what we now manage as our natural areas. And so when we think about restoring the East Woods, we really do have a good, uh, good palette to work with within this existing timber growth. And I'll, I'll get into that in a little bit um, in, the next, in the upcoming slides. Um, first, I just wanted to also emphasize the point. Here's another section of the East Woods with uh, some of the timber groves shown in the aerial photograph. And then we also have some of the property owners, uh, the property outlines right there matching right up with the, with the timber growth. So pretty fascinating to see how, how much these uh, people impacted the forest from back then and even still how evident the, the impact is today. Okay, so I'm going to use the uh, 1939 image again. So here it is on the left side, and an image of uh, today, essentially, uh, from 2008, on the right side. And you can see just how the landscape has changed over time. You can see, first of all, that the um, surrounding landscape around the Arboretum, which, by the way, is, of course, the white outlined boundary here, um, has changed quite a bit. So it moved from an agricultural landscape to a heavily uh, suburban or urban landscape in, in, in today's world. Um, but then drilling down into the East Woods themselves, uh, we have many more trees today. And so the outline of the East Woods is much different. And you can study the map and see all sorts of differences uh, from back then until today. And you can see how um, many more trees are growing in. And, and this uh, process of uh, filling in the landscape with trees has been documented as mesification. Um, this term and this concept has been pretty well studied and um, is pretty well understood. Um, and it, is cer it certainly applies to what I'm working with here within the Arboretum. So here's an image, a couple of images at the ground level looking at uh, the changes in the landscape from the late 1920s and through essentially today. You can see in the image on the left some of the canopy trees and some of the gaps within the canopy. You can see also along the forest floor uh, a lot of young saplings that are not quite reaching the canopy yet, but then give it about 90 or 100 years or so. And of course, what do those trees do? They grow and they fill in and they, they fill in those gaps, and that causes many changes within the forest. And uh, in this case, these trees are mostly sugar maple, um, but we also have basswood, and we have black cherry, and some other species that are filling in. So this process of mesification is moving the east woods from a fire-tolerant community dominated by oaks, as I mentioned, the white oak, the bur oak, and the red oak, from moving it from a fire-tolerant and shade-intolerant community to just the opposite, which would be a fire intolerant community and shade tolerant. And so this is the process that we've been facing and documenting over all these years. And so how are we to go about restoring this landscape? So when I began, um, basically we started with understanding the uh, past land usage within the Arboretum. Um, so I spent a great deal of time looking at uh, who did what, where did they do that, and how did they do it, and, and so on. Um, and, and then once I put the story together, such as how we got the property um, boundaries, the property deeds from all those different uh, parcel owners over time, and we were able to geo-reference them and put them into the um, GIS, um, we had the story put together for the names of the people, who moved in, and what did they do. But we also wanted to know um, a thing or two about the existing vegetation. And so all of these uh, dots on this landscape, on this uh, image here, represent long-term monitoring plots that we installed out into the East Woods. And, and there are about 500 of them out there. So these uh, plots are meant to uh, help us understand these changes over time. And so we have been out monitoring these changes. Uh, we've been out monitoring the vegetation. And we can see um, the existing vegetation as of, well, in this case, five years ago. The Quercus alba uh, class, uh, size class distribution is largely in the 50 to 60 or 70 centimeters um, size class. 
um, and very few of the uh, youngest size class. So this is what is um, referred to as the oak bottleneck. So we see a lot of older trees, but very few, if any, young uh, young seedlings and saplings within the within the forest floor and the regeneration layer. Um, meanwhile, we also have Acer saccharum, the sugar maple popping up in uh, large numbers within the understory. And you can see the size class distribution there on the right. Um, and also note that the, um, the difference in scale on the y-axis is, is different. So the Quercus alba um, only reaches up to 100 stems and the Acer saccharum up to 400, so a, a quite a quite a big difference there. So this is just more data showing us sort of graphically what is happening within the East Woods. That we have uh, the the white oaks in the canopy, um, and as they fail, the sugar maples will be taking their place if we don't do anything about that. Um, this is not just happening within the East Woods of the Arboretum, as I referenced earlier. This is happening throughout many forests of the Eastern United States. Um, including throughout Illinois, as shown here, the Illinois Natural Areas Inventory showed um, this sort of thing happening um, over time. So these are some um, rather these are some old uh, data uh, from from 1997 when the Natural Areas Inventory was uh, reassessed. And I just want to point out in this graph here that the dominance of sugar maple on the far left there has increased by about 7.5% between 1976 and 1997. And then if we move over to the white oak, we can see that during that same time frame, the dominance of white oak has actually uh, dropped off quite significantly by about 15%. We can also see that in this graph, uh, essentially the same thing is happening. Um, the, there are more sugar maples popping up indicated by these red lines. And the brown lines indicating uh, the changes in the oak uh, um, population uh, between 1976 and 1997, the, there are fewer canopy oaks, uh, or fewer stems per acre, I should say. Um, and then the diameter of them is shifting to the right within this, within this graph, indicating that they are aging and they're failing um, as a population. Um, and we can see, again, coming back into the Arboretum's East Woods, this is happening right before our eyes. We have a, uh, we've gone out to look at uh, all of these different points at each of those 500 plots that I pointed out earlier. Uh, we've taken photographs at different intervals. And so in 2007, the top image, you can see the forest. And you can see that just recently a photograph was taken at the same place in the bottom image you can see one of our canopy oaks has fallen. And so this is essentially what's happening within the East Woods. And so it is time to do something about this if we want to maintain oaks in our forest and utilize them as um, you know, a, a dominant factor within our forest. So what's a land manager to do? Well, many land managers use fire to uh, help restore our forest. And, and that is not unusual in our case as well. We're using plenty of fire here. In fact, we've been using fire for quite some time. Um, one of our oldest examples of the impacts of fire is, is taking place in this region here within the East Woods. We have kind of on the southern part of the East Woods a long-term uh, long study occurring where we've been using fire for about 30 years now. And this fire is taking place within this general area, within the red zone here. If you can look carefully, um, you can see a road that is, uh, I'm gonna try to use this arrow here. Hmm, it's not working for me here. So if we can look at the uh, center part of this, this uh, area, we can see a road coming in from the east, I'm sorry, from the west, and it actually cuts right across this red zone, and it goes all the way to this little opening here, and you can see that road. Well, what that is, that's a boundary line for a burn unit that has been burned annually 
and the adjacent area north of the road, which would be no burned. So it's unburned during that same time. And so this is actually um, an area that, has, uh, that we began burning in 1985. It was the first site where we burned within the East Woods, and then we just continued burning it um, every single year, even through the current period. So even though we don't have a photograph of, of the site back then, of what it looked like, I can tell you that anecdotally, anecdotally um, this is what it must have looked like. Thickets of invasive shrubs along the, along the forest floor, um, many saplings, uh, seedlings and saplings of trees um, growing up into the canopy oaks, um, just like you can see here in this white oak, uh, kind of in the center part of the image here. Um, so this would have been comparable to the starting conditions of, of, the, of the forest um, as it began burning. And after 35 year, after 30 years, we've learned a few things. And so these results here, these points will be taken from uh, Marlon Bowles' study that was published in 2007. Um, but basically, after a long-term fire, um, the burning at that interval shifts the ground layer vegetation due to the increased canopy light penetration. So what's happening is that the annual fires are essentially removing and impacting the uh, small diameter woody stems that are in the forest. So this would include the shrub layer. Um, and in this case, it virtually eliminated the shrub layer, which includes the subcanopy trees. Um, and so it would also indicate that the canopy layer was largely unaffected because the fires um, really didn't impact the larger diameter trees with um, more bark, for example, to buffer the temperature of the fires. Um, species richness, after all of these years of burning, has increased to more than 10 species per square meter. Um, and this is more equivalent to some of the old growth forest stands that were also measured as part of the Illinois Natural Areas Inventory. So what happened here is that these uh, species that were dormant in the, in the um, in the seed bank were able to express, them, express themselves over time and, um, and show up and start blooming. And the differences were really in uh, the differences in between the spring and summer flora. So the spring flora was largely the same in the burned and the unburned zone. Um, and that was largely because of the, uh, the canopy leaves that were not present at the time the spring ephemerals really start to grow. But by the time the summer flora shows up, um, the canopy is fully leafed out, and we have more shade in the unburned section of the forest. Meanwhile, in the, in the burned area, we have more sunlight penetrating through the canopy and reaching the ground layer. So we see a tremendous increase in the, in the diversity and the species richness in the burned zone. And this shows in the image behind the uh, text here. You can see some of the woodland sunflowers showing up, um, but you can also imagine more woodland uh, goldenrods and asters that are blooming much later into the season. Um, so species richness definitely improves with this level of burning. Um, and what does this do about the invasive species? The invasive species were essentially eliminated. Um, they were largely controlled there were still some here and there. So they did persist over even that level of, even that time frame. After all those years of burning annually, um, the invasive shrub layer was virtually eliminate, eliminated, but there were still pockets found here and there. And, and um, although it's not indicated in this paper, I know that uh, these pockets really, they kind of hung out around the uh, wet zones where, it was, where the fire just wasn't able to get to very well. Um, but then also, since there were pretty substantial uh, woody invasive shrubs like buckthorn and like honeysuckle, um, these substantial size, uh, the substantial size of these shrubs really allowed these uh, sort of isolated individuals to persist over time. So these, uh, these invasive species were largely controlled but persisted. And so this is an indication to a manager like myself 
that um, fire can be useful, but perhaps may not be the only answer for managing our forests. So if we look at how this site has fared, um, here's, here's an, a couple images just to compare the burned site on the left with the unburned site on the right. Um, you can see that the differences in the, in the ground layer, um, now if you look at the woody stems, these woody stems are um, largely controlled in the burned site, and in the unburned site, we still have a lot of woody uh, shrubs and, and saplings persisting in, in the uh, unburned section. But if we look into the canopy, it's hard to find differences between the two sites. So it uh, is an indication that fire is useful. Fire has been proven to um, improve species richness, but perhaps fire alone is not the only answer. And so if we look at uh, some more data, we can, we can see that the tree density, um, so this is a comparison of tree density from two different points five years apart, from 2006 to 2011. We can see that the trees, the trees per hectare um, between the two time frames really look pretty similar. So even across the rest of the East Woods, as I've begun managing the East Woods with more fire outside of just that annual burn plot, um, fire alone and, um, and some, some level of thinning has really not been significant enough to um, reduce the stem density. And here's just an image showing, a graph showing uh, comparison of those two time frames. In fact, the stem count, as you look at the information differently, we can tally up the uh, number of trees per hectare uh, between the two times, in 2006 and 2011, and you can look down all the way at the bottom, and you can see that the count goes up from 2006 to 2011. So after uh, more fire in other parts of the East Woods, and even with some level of uh, a moderate level of thinning and invasive species control, we still have an increase in the uh, number of trees per hectare. And so um, I'm asking myself if there's something else we can do. I've started referring to uh, a level of thinning, and that's, that's what we've been using more um, in recent days, in recent years. Um, you can see the same image, the same slide that I've showed earlier um, with two images from 1920s to uh, from 2010 on the right. And in the next uh, image, I'm popping up a, a, a site, the same site, shown in 2016. So I'm going to go back and forth again a couple times so you can see some of the differences between 2010 and 2016. Uh, you can see that in 2000, between 2010 and 16, we've actually gone in and started to thin the canopy. Uh, you can see some of the density has uh, changed, but uh, this relatively moderate amount of thinning um, still has largely left the canopy intact. So while there may be differences in the, um, in the ground layer and the light levels and the diversity of the species richness in the ground layer, um, there still are very few, if any, oaks in the understory. So um, this moderate level of thinning has not even been detected in all of this data that I've shown thus far. So what I've been toying with here is uh, incorporating different silvicultural methods into the uh, thinning process here. So if we think about uh, growing trees for the product of wood, um, certainly we're not in the business of doing that in ecological restoration, but there's a lot of good data from foresters and, and publications showing how oaks can be regenerated. And so through some of these silvicultural methods, um, we might be able to tap into these in order to help uh, recruit and regenerate another generation of oaks in, in our forest. So clear cutting has um, has been successful in some cases, but if I were to suggest clear cutting uh, within the East Woods, um, well, I'm not sure what would happen with the uh, general public and, and with, uh, with uh, 
you know, the forest at large here. So I'm not so sure that we're quite ready for clear cutting. And I think that there are some, if, it, if, if clear cuts are not managed appropriately, then there uh, is a potential for uh, things to go wrong within uh, the recruitment of another generation of, of oaks. Shelter woods have been um, successful in other sites, but we have uh, only begun uh, uh, this sort of uh, this well toying with the idea of a, of a shelter wood cut here. Um, but the shelter wood cut is is essentially when uh, seed trees are left in the canopy, and a lot of the understory or most of the understory um, is removed and then time is given for the for the canopy trees to set seed and for those seeds to produce another generation of oaks within the within the understory within the ground layer and then that regeneration layer would would eventually be released at some point year, several years down the road um, with a second cutting effort to remove the remaining canopy trees um, so this is a, a method that's used not only with oaks but with other um, different uh, trees, uh, pines for example, in, in forestry settings. Um, but I want to focus on the group selection, which is a technique that we uh, um, experimented with here within the East Woods. The group selection is a method I'm going I'm to talk about in a minute here, where basically you remove a small grouping of trees, just large enough to get something uh, regenerating within that uh, gap that was created. Um, and then the final one is a single tree selection, which actually is not even recommended for regenerating oaks, but might be useful for regenerating other species. So here's the group selection method that we uh, followed. Uh, so basically we laid out three different, um, well four different treatments. We have um, a group selection where we removed or we, we essentially created a 250 meter uh, a square meter gap in the canopy. Um, the understory cut, which would be a 250 square meter uh, removal of understory trees, so not impacting the canopy trees, but removing all of the um, understory and uh, overtopped trees. And then we have the understory plus the group selection, where we essentially cut out both of the um, two that I just mentioned. And then the control, which is um, the surrounding kind of white hatched areas around each of those thinning zones. And so just to point out, the objective was to determine the effects of these treatment factors on the survival and growth of underplanted white oaks. Um, so we, after making these cuts, we actually went in and planted some white oaks into the understory. So just to show you what this looks like here, the mechanical removals, um, we started off with the understory tree removal. And you can see uh, in this image in the, in the foreground, you can see some of, the, um, some of the remaining stumps of the understory trees that were removed, uh, indicated by the um, small stumps and the chainsaw dust that remains. Um, these are trees, again, that were removed from the understory. So the canopy trees were left in place, as you can see a couple of the large uh, uh, white oaks remaining there. The next type of mechanical removal we used was a group selection where we actually took out the, uh, the uh, canopy trees. And the uh, canopy trees were um, removed in a 250 square meter area around the center of the patch. So what you're looking at here is some of the downed wood with some of the understory trees remaining in place. The, the white oak in the foreground, kind of on the right, was just outside of the clear cut, uh, I'm sorry, outside of the uh, gap. So um, this one remained, but just off in the distance, you can see some of the trunks of the canopy trees that were actually removed um, from, this, from this cutting effort here. And the most aggressive cutting that was done was a group selection plus the understory removal where the uh, 250 square meter gap was created in the canopy, and uh, those were done by creating uh, by removing the canopy trees, but also by removing 
the uh, understory trees as well. And this, if you were to look up into this gap, it would create um, the biggest uh, impact in the forest here. And then we have the control, which was uh, essentially not cutting anything. After we've made the cuts, we planted some white oaks into the uh, understory. And I'm just giving you the abbreviated highlights here. Um, the oak, what we did is we measured the twig elongation of all the underplanted oaks. And we found that in the, uh, the understory plus the group uh, cutting, the twig elongation was significantly different than the control. Um, so what you can see here is that even with the group selection alone, it did not differ from the, uh, from the uh, control, and nor did the understory cutting alone differ from the control. So in order to see the best results of underplanted white oaks, um, thinning the understory plus the group, plus the group uh, selection was the most significant. So um, this is uh, also important to point out that during the time, during the three years of measurement, measuring the uh, oak twig elongation, uh, no fire was used to uh, manage the forest. Also, during those three years, we had to go in multiple times to control the invasive species that were starting to pop up. So we had invasive honeysuckle and buckthorn and oriental bittersweet um, starting to grow over some of the trees and um, had to be controlled. Otherwise, they would have been uh, lost to the um, infestation here. So the implications for practice. Um, successful oak establishment and growth may be possible with intensive management in forests being overtaken by understory tolerant trees like the sugar maples and lindens um, while maintaining a negative visual impact. And so um, this, this visual impact was important for us because of the um, political climate or the public reaction, I should say, um, within the region. Uh, these small group selections were actually chosen as a way to see if we could do just enough to get uh, uh, to find a difference in the uh, oak regeneration layer um, without cutting too much. And this image that you're looking at here is actually the most aggressive um, type of cutting that we did. And so it really doesn't look too um, problematic or too destructive in the middle of the growing season. So you can see lots of lush growth, but you can also see um, the sun shining right there in the kind of the center part of the image here. Um, oak regeneration can be enhanced in oak forests by using small 250 square meter group selection openings together with understory removal and the use of planting stock of about uh, one inch in diameter. And we planted these trees, which were about an, a meter and a half tall. The need for thinning to release planted trees and shrubs should be assessed beginning at least 10 years after the planting was done. Um, and that's especially important because we didn't use any fire during this, um, during, the, during the three years of measurement. Um, we only controlled invasive species during the three years of, of the, the project, but then it's important to go back in um, at, at a later point to assess how those trees are doing. And that is uh, something we're going to need to do here in the near future to make sure that uh, we can see how this sort of practice um, uh, performs long term. And as I mentioned before, invasive species control must be continued throughout the duration of the ecological restoration project um, without dealing with any of the invasive species, the project would have ended uh, much differently. Uh, Oriental bittersweet, Rhamnus cathartica, and Limnistra macchia were the three primary invasive species that we had to continue to control throughout this experiment. Um, without doing that, then the trees could have been overtopped by all of those invasive species there.
if you want to read a little bit more about the details of this experiment, uh, you can look into the Ecological Restoration um, Journal article from June of 2014, and that'll tell you a, a lot more about the project that we weren't able to uh, cover in today's webinar. And so, lessons learned. Um, when used alone, prescribed fire, so thinking about uh, kind of the overall um, lessons that we've learned here at the Arboretum, um, we've been using fire for many decades, and prescribed fire, although it can improve species richness um, and control invasive species within the oak woodlands, but it's not enough uh, to sustain the forest overall. Uh, prescribed fire should be used in combination with other management strategies, particularly invasive species control. And restoration practitioners should collaborate with silviculturists and forest ecologists to, do, to prescribe canopy thinning measures to fully meet ecological restoration goals within oak woodlands. Um, and this is pretty important, I feel, because we have, uh, you know, because chainsaws when, when practitioners go into the forest and start managing, chainsaws can, can make a big impact in, in a hurry. And so having uh, a process and a, a prescribed method can be uh, beneficial for the, for the restoration of our oak woodlands. So I'll, with that, I will open it up for a couple of questions. I think I ended just a few minutes early, but maybe if we have time for questions, then I'll turn it over to Claire. Yeah, so um, we are going to go a little bit long due to our late start with the technical issues. Um, if you do need to leave, just remember we're recording it and um, that'll be up soon. I'll email all of you with the uh, YouTube link and you can uh, hear the Q&A session that way. Um, okay, let me see. All right. I don't see any questions yet. Oh, here's one. Um, let me see. So uh, this is a question. If oak regeneration is successful and fire is used to give oak a competitive advantage, would you need to consider a fire-free interval while the trees are at least in the sapling size class? So that is something that uh, is really important and I think I wonder the same thing. We have actually uh, so the general consensus, I think, is yes, that a fire-free interval is recommended. Um, in this case of the study that we conducted here, we had three years without fire for the trees to establish. Um, since those three years expired, we have used fire in that forest. And I know that uh, some of the trees are stressed out. In fact, some of them may have succumbed, may have died, in fact. Um, but that's kind of speaking an anecdotally. And I think it would be good to go back and see the impact of, of fire on, on those trees. Um, also, after this study was completed, we have expanded this in conjunction with our forest ecology lab here. And we've used a slightly different methodology where we've incorporated these treatments, uh, th different thinning treatments, into uh, different sections of the East Woods. And we, so we don't have results yet of the study, which is why I wasn't talking about it today. Um, but some of these uh, treatments were actually installed into the annual burn treatment. So even with annual fire, I guess the question would be how much success would these oak seedlings have um, with such high frequency of fire? And so um, much to my surprise, I've seen a fair amount of oak uh, seedling growth in, the, in this one particular spot, but um, you know, so we still need a little bit more time in order to, to determine that and its finality. Um, do you have oak wilt in the woods? And if so, do you view that as providing a natural thinning process? So yes, uh, we do have oak wilt in the woods and we have, um, is it a natural thinning process? I guess if it's unmanaged, then yes, that would be essentially what happens because oak wilt can kill 
um, particularly the red oaks. Um, we have seen a fair amount of it, but we also have um, many different programs here within the Arboretum that are interested in oak wilt. And so, for example, our pathology lab might be interested in, you know, fungicide treatments within the trees. Um, we've used, not so much in the east woods, but in more of the cultivated settings, we've used trenching around the, the trees to, uh, you know, disconnect the, the uh, grafted roots. Um, but doing something like that in the east woods is, is, um, is, is a bit tough. to stomach because of the destruction it can cause. Um, so it is a natural thinning process if it's left unmanaged. And so far, we've really not left it unmanaged. We've been in there to remove the trees uh, before, the, it, before it spreads too much. And also, as I mentioned, we've had some uh, fungicide uh, treatments here and there as well. Luckily, the oak wilt outbreak has not been so severe like it has in other parts of the country, though. So perhaps we have that going for us at the moment. Uh, the next question, I think this is probably in, in reference to the group thinning. Um, is it important to down the canopy trees, or can they just be killed and left standing? Um, so I think it just depends on the objectives of your study. So in, in this particular case, we did cut them and haul them off site. And we were interested in utilizing the wood for different purposes. So there was kind of this other part of the project that we had working on as well. Um, but just killing them off, just by you know, maybe treating them with uh, you know, herbicide at the base of the trunk, for example, that might be another option, or girdling them and using herbicide in combination. That might also be uh, useful. And in fact, that sort of uh, practice might be helpful in some of the restoration uh, practices when we think about the uh, community of life that these trees can bring to, you know, cavity nesting birds, for example. Um, so leaving the trees in place is something that can be beneficial. And in fact, I didn't mention it, but we did leave a couple of the dead standing trees in place for that purpose because of the nature of uh, the work here. So again, I think it just depends on your objectives, but uh, both options have their benefits, I think. Um, I see someone typing. I guess I'll, I'll go ahead and ask, ask a question while uh, that one is hopefully coming in. Um, so when you do the group thinning, you mentioned you kind of open the canopy, uh, open a lot more light coming down, and you do see this surge in um, invasive plants in the understory, which you then have to manage to um, make any kind of regeneration successful. How, for what length of period would you expect to have to really do enhanced invasive plant management um, in the thinned area? So I guess it would depend on the growth of the trees. So without really giving you a defined number of years, I think that you would just have to look at the, the growth, the height, and the um, competitive stature of, of the regeneration layer compared to the, uh, the invasive uh, species, whichever they are. So if you're focusing on herbaceous species, you know, you know, those, are, those might generally be considered shorter than woody shrubs and, and woody trees that might be invasive. Um, so as long as you can get the oaks or the regeneration layer to a point where they're kind of out of reach of the, of the invasive species, I think that would be the most key factor. Um, and that might be a little bit more uh, challenging with some of the vines, like I mentioned, oriental bittersweet, which can just grow right up um, into the canopy of some of even these canopy oak trees that we're dealing with. So I guess the answer is it depends. Yeah, fair <laughs> enough. Um, so this is a two-parter. Um, the first part was how many how many oaks were planted in the treatment plots uh, where you had done various types of thinning. 
Um, and then the second question is, is about seedling protection from fire. Like, are, are there ways you can still burn the area but protect those particular seed, uh, seedlings or saplings uh, by either removing fuel around the base or um, managing ignition or maybe even using water um, strategically? Okay. So we planted uh, two trees into each of the treatments. So we had um, 108 trees planted out into this uh, into these into the study. Um, so it was a relatively small number, and again, that was in one site. But um, you know, that was what uh, what we could what we could swing at the time, uh, planting two into each of the treatments plus two into the controls for comparison. Um, and as I mentioned, these trees were already three to four years old. So they were one and a half meters in height and then um, basically an inch in diameter. Um, so they were pretty substantial trees when they were, when they were planted. Um, the second question was about uh, protecting the trees from fire, protecting mm -hmm. saplings from fire. And that is something that um, I think um, I think we can get away with, well, so first of all, I'll start off by saying that the oaks are fire tolerant. So that means they can tolerate fire at some frequency. Um, in their youth, it's generally recommended to let them, in, in some of the literature, it's generally recommended to let them go through a fire-free period of a few years before fire is used. But even when fire is used, those oaks depending on the fuel load around them, those oaks can become top killed and, and re-sprout from the base again. Um, and so over time, the fuel loading around those seedlings becomes really important. Uh, how moist the fuel is at the time of the burn is important. Um, and then, of course, the weather parameters that we, we think about when lighting fires is important as well. Um, all of that together really does impact what is going to happen to that oak seedling. Um, wetting down or somehow providing shelter for the seedling is something that can be done. Um, I think in special situations where where um, you know there might be um, a special need to protect those trees, but to you know basically warrant the extra resources, the manpower to to go ahead and do that. I think is, uh, is 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 something that the manager is going to have to make the call during the during the fire. Um, I've seen a lot of oaks that were protected. The fire they were protected before the fire come through came through, and then the fire came through a little hotter than expected, and then you know the tree essentially was fire scarred or damaged or even was top killed afterwards. But then in the subsequent year, the tree made its way back either from the base if it was a really youthful tree um, it can it sprouted from the base or maybe it sprouted from the trunk from sort of the dormant buds within the tree itself um, it just depends on the, the situation um, so just kind of generalizing my answer now I would say that early on in managing the oak uh, this the young oaks that were popping up within the arboretum's east woods um, we did actually protect them when we could. But then as the, the nature of our burns, uh, as the scale of our burns grew, uh, it just became un really impractical, impractical to, uh, to protect all of the oaks. And what we've found is that they seem to be doing okay afterwards, after the fire. Um, they can kind of hammer hammer out the burn um, with uh, minimal damage in some cases, but when the fire, when the fuel loading is especially um, high around some of these trees, with prairie grasses, for example, surrounding them, then, um, then they can become quite damaged. Um, so just to go back to the question on density uh, and the experimental plots, it was two uh, per 250 square feet. So uh, you can scale that up into acres, but uh, we're not going to do the calculation in just a second. Right, two per 250 yeah. square meters. Yep. Oh, square meters, not square feet. Thank you. <laughs> um, so 
Well, what was the deer density at, at Morton uh, during the experiment, and did you protect the, the uh, planted oaks from browse? So, yeah, and that was something I didn't go into. We, we don't have definitive numbers of deer density at Morton, uh, but working with the county that we're in, in the Forest Preserve District, which has um, some data on the deer density, it was about 20 deer per mile. Um, so it is fairly a manageable population, um, and that's due to many years of deer population control throughout the county and actually throughout the region. So um, we would assume that the count, the count or the density is pretty similar to what the county is finding. Um, and so we did actually protect some of the trees from the deer browse, and we found that there was no significant difference in the growth between those that were protected and those that were not protected. All right, we'll make this our last question for today, since so we're uh, just a little bit over the hour mark. Um, do you have, uh, did you measure earthworm density at all um, at, at the experimental control site? No, we did not measure earthworm density. That would be something interesting to look at, though. Okay. All right. Um, well, th that will bring us to the end here. Um, I want to thank Kurt so much for his time putting this together, and thank you all as well for attending. Um, you'll get an email from me soon uh, when the YouTube video is up and uh, you can look at that at your